Well, thank you so much for coming this morning. Uh, this sounds like a great program today. I'm really excited to be on stage here with Annika. Um, for those of you who don't know, she has a wonderful story about becoming the CEO of her company. And I think as many of you know, it's just when you look at Fortune 500 companies, just 5% of them are led by women. And I was going through last night and looking to see who some of those women were. And it's even more rare to see a woman like Annika uh, leading a company. And so I am so happy that you guys get to hear her story, um, how her childhood, how her experience in college, and how her experiences at work led her to the position that she is in today. Um, what we're going to do first is Annika's going to tell a little bit about her story, and I'll probably be peppering her with some questions. And then we're going to open it up for you all to ask questions as well. So we're going to have two mic runners, um, and Annika and I will select which, uh, which questions she's going to take. And the great thing about her as a journalist, she's like, ask me anything. Ask me anything. I don't <laughs> care. True. I'm open. It's true. So I love that. <laughs> it's, it's so rare you get somebody in business who's like, ask me anything. Um, so think about that for you guys as you're listening to her story um, and you have questions. So, Annika, I would love for you to start by telling us just a little bit about your path. Absolutely. First of all, I want to say I'm super honored to be here. So thank you for having me here. And I'm excited to share my story with you. Uh, so I was born and raised in the Bay Area. I have some of my family members here. My mom is sitting over there and my sister is sitting up here in the front row. Uh, and it's uh, it's been great. It's been amazing to see how the Bay Area has changed over the past 30 years. And uh, so I was born and raised here. Uh, my parents are both immigrants from India. So they came here in the late 60s and early 70s for graduate school. My mom was an electrical engineer. My dad was a mechanical engineer. Um, and they both worked in the Bay Area at the well, the tech scene was just getting started. And uh, in the 80s, they both decided to start their own companies separately. So they each started their own companies, um, ended up taking their companies public. Uh, and so I had these amazing role models that I grew up with that encouraged my curiosity, encouraged me to learn, encouraged me to be um, interested in technology and engineering and math and science. Uh, and, and that was amazing. So when I went to college, um, I thought that I was going to go and major in physics because I was really excited by like thinking about how the world works. I got to college and in my first year realized that was not the path for me at all. Um, I really did not connect with anyone else that was in the program and it was not exactly what I expected. And so as I was considering what I wanted to do, I was looking at a lot of the engineering degrees. But something that really struck me was that all the engineering degrees at Stanford were huge number of classes. Um, and huge number of units. And so if I took an engineering degree, I wouldn't be able to explore other classes and other areas. And I've always been really interested in history and creative writing and many things outside of just uh, math and sciences. And so when I was looking through the, the different majors, I found one that was an interdisciplinary major. So it was a little bit of math, a little bit of computer science, a little bit of statistics, a little bit of industrial engineering, and it was still a fairly small major. So I was able to take many other classes. Uh, and I really, really enjoyed that experience, being able to pick and choose what I wanted to focus on and still getting uh, a really solid technical foundation. So when I graduated um, in 2010, I was looking at different companies in the Bay Area, and I was really interested in being in tech, uh, and I wanted to be at a small company because I was looking at how do I, I wanted to understand how a company is run, how are decisions made. Uh, and so I, I started looking for different companies and I wanted to live in San Francisco. So I focused mostly in San Francisco and I started applying to software engineering roles and product manager roles. And I applied to a lot of companies. I didn't have a full computer science degree. So it was actually a little bit difficult for me to get a, a software engineering role, but I did um, at my company, LiveRamp. And at the time, uh, when I was interviewing, I remember saying that I was really interested potentially in product management as a career path. Uh, and one thing that struck me is um, our head of engineering at the time told me, hey, you know, if that's a path you're interested in, our company is hopefully going to grow at some point. And at that point, we'll need product managers. And we'd love to, if it makes sense, for you to move into product management. So I was excited about that, but I didn't, wasn't counting on that because you never know how these things are going to turn out. Uh, and so I joined the company. 
And I joined as a software engineer and I had great time building products. This was still at a time when the company was finding product market fit. So we would build things, tear them down, rebuild them again. Um, and I got to end up doing, like, in retrospect, doing a lot of product management because we didn't have product managers. So I was deciding what we were going to build, deciding what it was going to look like, and then just prototyping it and getting it out the door. Um, eventually, we landed on a product that uh, would take us on our first uh, wave of growth, and that was Pretty, uh, that was in the uh, end of 2011. And at that time, our head of engineering came to me and said, hey, now is an opportunity. Do you want to do product management? It actually took me a couple of months for me to decide that I was going to make that switch from engineering to product management because I was really enjoying what I was doing. But I recognized that I was never going to be the world's best engineer. Um, it was just not what I was passionate about or uh, interested in. And so I decided to make the switch. And I was like, I might as well try out now what what product management is like and see if this is the path for me. So I did that for a year. I was the first product manager, which meant that I was doing product management, customer support, troubleshooting with engineering, like basically everything under the sun. And it was really exciting. Uh, and then at the end of that year, uh, our the woman that was running our marketing team decided to move to Australia. So it was going to be very hard for her to continue to work for the company. And I had worked a lot with the marketing team on helping them set up their technology and, and get some of their programs up and running. And so I offered to our CEO to help with some of the marketing initiatives. Uh, and I was really interested in learning about marketing because I thought that that was really the other side of product management that I didn't have a good experience with. I came from the technical background, but I wanted the outward facing experience as well. And so our CEO came back and said, hey, if you want to run the marketing team until we hire someone, uh, you can do that or you can just decide to work on a few projects. And for me, that was a great opportunity, seemed pretty low risk because we were planning on hiring someone. It ended up taking a year to hire someone. So I ran the marketing team for a year. And six months into that, our CEO came back to me and said, hey, do you want to run recruiting as well? Because it's a lot like marketing. <laughs> Instead of marketing to potential customers, you're marketing to potential employees. So what, like, you can do both of them. And so I, I decided to try that too. And it was really, that was very fun. Uh, it was a little bit challenging to balance doing both. Um, so when we, when we hired a, a head of marketing, our CEO came back to me and said, hey, like, what do you want to do next? You can either run HR and recruiting for the company. You can run, or you can stay an individual contributor on the marketing team, or, um, or you can run the product team. And for me, like my heart was in product management. So I came back to run the product team. And that was in 2014. And uh, at the time, the product team was two people uh, and then me, so three people total. Uh, and I did product management for about three and a half years up until September last year when um, our CEO decided to move on and do something else. And then I became co-CEO with our head of sales um, of the company. And yeah, it's been a really exciting journey. By the time I left product management, I was managing a team of about 70 people across our, our technical services team and product management team. One thing that strikes me about your story is it, you have this great combination of saying, hey, I want to try this, and people saying to you, hey, why don't you try this? For those who are out there, how do you, how do you find you know, the best way to communicate what your goals are? Because I think oftentimes women are afraid to raise their hand yeah. and say, I want to do this. So you worked for a small company that grew really fast. So how did you strike that balance? So I think I was really lucky in that I joined a company where the leaders of the company were very dedicated to growing the employees and cared a lot about creating a great culture. Uh, and I was struck by that when I was interviewing, but I did not fully appreciate that at the time that I joined the company. And so I was lucky in that the leaders were always asking me, hey, what do you want to be doing? And then in, I shared a few instances, then coming to me and giving me those opportunities and trusting that they could put me in a role that I had never done before and they would support me and they would help me try to be successful in that role. Uh, so that was, that was great. And then I think like part of that relationship too, was me sharing what it was that I wanted to learn. So we would do like annual reviews and I put a lot of time into coming up with like my own, um, self-reflection as part of our annual reviews to, um, talk about like, here are the things that I would really like to work on. And I spent a lot of time really thinking about that. And I think that helped a lot of the leaders at the company then recognize, okay, these are the areas that I might be interested in and giving me opportunities in those areas. And 
And then of course, like it's really important that when you take on those jobs, you start doing a good job as well. So working really hard uh, and really trying to understand the strategy and what are what is the things what are the things that you can do to add the most value and to drive the most value for the company. And I think that was that was always like, you know, I was in these roles and I had small teams to begin with. So there was a very limited number of things to do. So really prioritizing those things so that I could show that I had made results. You've worked in pretty much every single department in your company. What was it like to come in and be kind of the younger person having to supervise people who had much more experience than you? Yeah, that was uh, when I get asked sometimes about what my experience is like being a woman in leadership, I have a really hard time often distinguishing between being a woman versus being a lot younger than a lot of the people that I'm working with. Um, and this really came like was highlighted to me uh, when we were acquired. So we were acquired about four years ago. And uh, we were acquired by a 45-year-old company that is based in Arkansas. And the employee workforce of the company is, as you can imagine, a very dim different demographic than in, in San Francisco. And job security is a, a much bigger issue in Arkansas than in San Francisco. Um, so when we came in, so when we came in, we were kind of viewed as these kids coming into the company and telling people that had been there for a very long time what to do. And so I very quickly had to figure out how do I interact with and how do I build connections with people that are very different from me and people that are a lot older than me and a lot more experienced than me. Um, and I think then, like in later years, when I had to start managing people that were a lot more experienced than me, uh, that that helped me. I think some of the things that I learned was just really the power and value of creating strong relationships and trying to figure out from anyone that you interact with, whether it's a subordinate or someone um, that's your equal or someone above you, like what is it that I can learn from this person and having a lot of curiosity about people and uh, caring about people a lot and, all, and thinking about like how are the things that you're doing and how are the things that your policies that you're creating in your company or different projects can affect different people and then um, helping them through change and helping them through um, helping them uh, and making them part of the process of, of rolling out new things. And so I think all of those experiences really helped me, uh, but it's definitely been really challenging at times because I've, I've had people make pretty, pretty crazy comments towards me sometimes of like, oh, you're too young, like you don't know what you're doing, uh, things like that. And that can be really challenging, but I try to just let it go and not escalate the situation and then try to really try hard to build a relationship with that person so that they understand too that not only am I trying to learn for them, from them, but I, I have something to offer as well. When you became CEO, what was that like? You you saw the company pretty much launch and then grow, and then now you're, you're at the top. So it was a really, really hard transition for the first four or five months uh, for a variety of reasons. One was that uh, there had just been a lot of change at the company. We had a lot of people leaving. So this was at the, towards the end of last year. And uh, overall, like I would say the sentiment at the company was fairly negative. Um, so it was coming into an environment where not everything was going as positively as we wanted and people weren't feeling that great. And then on top of that, it was a really hard transition for me to transition from being peers with the rest of my executive team to then managing those people. And, and I was the youngest person on the executive team. So I think for some, some of the dynamics went really well um, and some of the dynamics were a lot more challenging. I had one person on the team who really felt like like he, he felt like he should have gotten the job instead of me. So that was a dynamic we had to work through. Um, I had someone on the team that in February I ended up having to let go, who was one of the people that hired me onto the, into the company, which is all a very, another very, very challenging and, and emotional situation. Um, so there was a lot of things that I had to, to work on. And at first, I was so scared about doing something wrong that I, I kind of shut down and I didn't want to hear people's feedback because I thought they were just going to tell me, oh, you don't know what you're doing. Uh, but like, over a couple of months, I realized that I couldn't function like that. And there were things that I personally needed to improve upon. So I started becoming more receptive to feedback and started not being afraid about making changes and changing the status quo. Um, and I, that really helped. And slowly but surely, I think we turned things around and people started feeling really positive about where we were going and the fact that we were hearing out their problems and, and making changes. And so the changes ended up being a very positive thing for the organization versus being a negative thing. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you got that feedback? Because I think as you kind of 
rise up in different positions. Um, you have to be careful about what you share yeah. and you, but you also want to make sure that you have your pulse on what's happening in the room. Yeah. So how did you get that? And then how did you take that feedback and, and, and use it to the advantage of yourself and the company? So there are a few different things. So sometimes people will share feedback directly with me, harsh feedback or uh, less sharp, harsh criticism. Uh, and that's really great because then you're hearing directly from someone what they're actually feeling and you can ask questions. Um, more often, I was hearing feedback through the grapevine. So there are people on my team who I really trust who have a lot of connections in the organization and people will go tell them things instead of telling me, uh, which is helpful because then I can go talk to that person and get a sense of what's happening across the organization. So sometimes Sometimes that happened more proactively because I was reaching out to that person to try to get feedback. And sometimes it was happening more reactively where someone who felt comfortable talking to me would come to me and say, here's how the organization is feeling or this person in this kind of leadership position um, told me this. Uh, and then if there were specific problems that I started to hear across the organization, I would go and dig in more into those issues and really try to understand the root cause of what's going on. Because often when someone's giving you feedback, they're they're identifying uh, they're, they're identifying a problem, but the problem they think is the problem may not actually be the problem. And so it's very important to actually figure out what is the true root cause of the problem before you start coming up with solutions. Uh, and then one thing I did was that at the end of last year, uh, kind of at the height where everyone is feeling pretty negative in the organization, um, I had promised that we would share a 90-day um, from our listening tour from the first 90 days on the job this is what we're hearing. So what I did is I came up with like eight things that I'd heard from the organization, either questions or pretty, pretty aggressive comments. And I put them on the slides and I said, okay, this, like, I'm trying to work to make this organization better. I'm trying to work to be a better leader myself. Uh, and I need all of your help in making that happen. And I went through each of the eight slides and I talked about, okay, this is what I'm hearing in the organization. This is what I'm going to, I'm personally going to do to help make this better. And here's what I'm going to, well, here's what I'm asking all of you to do to help me fix this problem, to help the whole leadership team fix this problem. And I think that was a real turning point in my mind. I think people really started recognizing that, hey, first, like we were taking their feedback really seriously. And it wasn't just like point, you can't just point leader your finger at leadership, you also have to figure out what you can do as an employee to help make the situation better. How have you had to deal with the imposter syndrome? If you haven't had yes. it, then oh, bless no. you. But I think probably everybody in this room has been like, oh my gosh, I don't think I should be in this job, but here I am. What do yeah. I do? Well, there are a few things. One is I certainly feel it all, like, all the time. I, uh, the first thing I try to do is just compartmentalize it. Um, and this is how I deal with a lot of different emotional situations is try to acknowledge and feel the emotions that I'm going to feel, but also recognize that a lot of those feelings are not rational feelings. Uh, so that's like the first thing that I can do myself. And then but the second thing is I talk to people. I, I talk to people that I love and trust, um, people that will tell me the truth. So they, they, may, they will tell me like, hey, actually, you don't know what you're doing here and this is what you need to do differently. Um, and also the people that are going to give me like a lot of love and support and tell me, no, like you're crazy. Don't think that way. Um, and that I think helps make it feel like less of an internal thing that I have to deal with and helps me cope with it with and recognize that there are all these amazing people around me who are going to support me and help me be successful. What role have mentors played in your career? huge role. Uh, I mean, I had such great mentors and all of my people managers at LiveRamp, which I was incredibly lucky to have. And it's something that I try to promote now in the organization by making sure that we're training every manager to be a, to be a champion for the people that they manage. Um, but yeah, I've had like our, 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 my first manager at LiveRamp, my second manager at LiveRamp, our CE, our previous CEO, um, all of them would meet with me often, would really cared and really felt like they wanted to grow in my career. And even, even my manager now, who's the CEO of our parent company, um, he's constantly coming to me and being like, I want to help you be like, if you want to be a fortune 500 CEO, like I will help you do that. Um, and so I've been, I, I feel incredibly lucky that I've had so many mentors within the company. And then of course they're like my network outside and I've been able to leverage them by really trying to understand again what can I learn from those people and then reaching out to them when I have a situation where I want their guidance and want their advice and, and that's really helped me gain a lot of skills that I just don't I had, didn't start with. So for somebody who's just starting out in their career how did you find your mentors? 
That's a good question. Um, I, so I think some of them kind of appeared. Um, one of the things that I did uh, looking in retrospect, I don't know if I did this that consciously was I, I made, I reached out to a lot of people in the company very early on in my career to build relationships because I was just really curious about what they did. I, one of the reasons I had joined a startup company was to understand how a company works. So I started reaching out to a lot of people. And in that process, I think I started finding people that, oh, there's like, this person has a lot of knowledge. Like I can learn a lot from, from this person and started building those relationships and just asking for help and, and asking more questions to them. And I think that's what ended up fostering a lot of these relationships. And now in your current position, how do you find time to mentor? So for those of us who moved up higher, you know, how do you make that part of your, what, what your normal routine is? Because I know you're incredibly busy, um, but mentors have played a, an important role yeah. for you. Yeah. I, I make a lot of effort to try to mentor people in the organization. Obviously I cannot be the mentor to every single person. Now our company is 500 people. So that's, that's nearly impossible. Uh, so what I do is I try to, first of all, support programs that help, um, help create mentors in the organization and then help match people to mentors. Um, I try to um, make myself available and approachable to everyone in the organization. So I do these new hire breakfasts for every cohort of new hires that we have that starts at the company. And I go to them and I'm like, we, we just have an informal breakfast. And I tell them, you can ask me whatever questions you want. You can ask me about work. You can ask me about um, our strategy. You can ask me about my personal life. Whatever you want is on the table. And people come out and ask a lot of questions and it enables me to build a relationship, even if it's in a short period of time with, um, with a lot of people in the organization. Uh, and then for people that ask for career advice. I, I will never say no to someone who wants to meet with me at our company and talk about their career. Uh, and so not obviously not everyone is comfortable doing that, but there are a lot of people that take me up on that. And I always will talk to them and give them my honest advice and give it like in as an unbiased way as possible. Like sometimes that advice even means that advising them that maybe staying at LiveRamp is not what the what's best for you. Uh, and I think that those those are the different mechanisms I use. But yeah, it's always there's always a question of prioritization. There's so much going on. But for me, prioritizing people is like first and foremost the thing that I have to do because the company is nothing without its people. So what does your day look like if you're <laughs> squeezing in all these meetings with everybody who asks, you know, for feedback or, you know, can you please tell me what I should be doing? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it can be pretty crazy sometimes. I mean, um, so my EA, Emma is here and she is amazing and she keeps me sane and makes sure that like my schedule is not, um, so crazy that I just kind of completely lose motivation or all of my energy is drained. I think it's so important to look at work as it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. You can't constantly be sprinting. You have to make sure that what you're doing gives you energy every day. And so my schedule is, you know, in a given week, I have one-on-ones with my most of my direct reports. Um, some of those are half an hour. Some of those are an hour, depending on, you know, how how many problems are in that function or, you know, whatever the, the different rationale is for that. Um, I try to do like sprinkling customer meetings. That's something I would like to do more of. I think right now I've been more skewed towards doing things internally. Um, uh, but to those will come up probably like, you know, once a week at least. Um, and then beyond that, like it depends on, uh, what, where I am deciding I need to focus my time. So at any given point in time, um, I'm thinking about like, what are the big projects that need my attention? And sometimes that's new initiatives. So maybe we need to focus on new ways that we can grow our business. And then I'll spend a lot of time with either trying to figure out people that can um, can go run with some of these initiatives that we have, start coming up with strategy with them, spending my time in that area. Sometimes it might be hiring. Like I might need to make critical hires for my team. So 30% of my time starts going into hiring. Um, sometimes it's just like we have weeks, like this week we have quarterly business reviews. So my whole week was going through different parts of the business and learning about what was happening and then asking questions and trying to help solve problems or help uncover other opportunities for the business. So it really varies quite a bit. And that's actually one of the things I really enjoy about what I do is that no day, no two days are the same. Uh, and I get to, I get to learn a lot every single day and I get to contribute in a lot of different ways, um, every single day. And how do you squeeze in time for you? 
it's all all has to go on the schedule. So <laughs> I think it's um, to me there is the Emma laughing. Over yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, so I you know I have things on my calendar that are like sacred things for me, like going to the gym. So I will do that three days a week, and it's on my calendar. So things don't get scheduled. Oh, that doesn't get scheduled over. Um, I try to plan like different weeknight activities with my friends, plan specific things on the weekends that I think are going to help me recharge. Uh, but it, I mean, it's, I think like it all ebbs and flows. Like sometimes work is more crazy and sometimes it, it's less crazy. And sometimes my, things that are happening outside of work are more crazy and sometimes it's less busy. And so it's all this balancing act of like just trying to fit everything in and fit all the puzzle pieces together. Um, and sometimes it works really well and sometimes it doesn't. And when it doesn't, it's about looking back and saying, okay, what, what happened in the previous month or previous few weeks where this was just way too much? And then course correcting and figuring out, okay, what do I need to do going forward to better, uh, to make sure that like I'm getting energy out of everything I'm doing. So what are some of the activities you like doing? You talked about exercising. Yeah. So I, I like powerlifting. So that's what I do for exercise. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It's very metrics driven. So it, it, um, it <laughs> feeds into my goal oriented mindset. Um, so that's great. And then um, I love to read. So I'll often, I'm a pretty early riser and my husband is, he usually wakes up three hours later than me. So in the morning on the weekends, I'll read for a while, which is great. I like reading nonfiction. Um, and then I also like reading science fiction and fantasy. That's my escapist uh, reading. Um, I like spending time in the outdoors. Uh, so going on hikes, um, traveling to places that have uh, beautiful outdoor activities. Uh, I like, I love traveling. I love eating. Uh, so going out to restaurants, I don't really cook. I can cook a little bit, but not too much. Uh, and yeah, I mean, those are just the, I'm sure there's more, more there too, but yeah, no, I think what I, what I found personally, and I think a lot of the women that I know is it's really hard to find that time for you. Yeah, it um, is. And so making sure that you put that in the schedule and figuring out what does make you recharge so that you do have energy. <laughs> it's definitely challenging. And I would say I've done a, a, yeah. a much worse job in the previous month than I have before that. So it's time to reevaluate that again. But yeah. it's, uh... We're going to open it up to questions soon. But one thing that I did want to ask about, um, and I think, you know, we hit on it at the very, in the, some of the opening remarks was, you know, we've heard a lot about Me Too. Um, I would like to know from your perspective in a, in a kind of male-dominated area, how have you had to deal with Me Too and how has your company um, dealt with that as well? So I've been very fortunate in that I haven't been in a situation that has been in like egregious sexual harassment or uh, anything like that. Um, I have a lot of people that I work with that have certainly been in those positions before, um, mostly not at other companies, um, especially people in client facing roles. I think it's really challenging when it's within your company, it's something you can address. But when you're dealing with a client, there's only so much you can do about um, a client's bad behavior. Um, so that that's really challenging. I think um, I what I uh, think is sometimes missing the Me Too movement, but I, 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 there is more conversation being talked about this, is that there's a really egregious behavior that absolutely should we should have zero tolerance about. And then there's like the smaller things that um, discourage women from taking leadership positions or that don't allow them to thrive and succeed in the workplace. And I think it's really imperative that all leaders are looking for those areas where like why, like why, if you have certain teams in your company where women are leaving those teams uh, and going to other teams because they don't feel and, and that's a sign that probably something's going on on that team or you don't have any women in leadership positions and there's no bench of women in leadership positions um, there's something going on in that team and we had an instance of that where we had a team uh, at live ramp where people where a lot of women were leaving the team and so I talked to the leader of that team who was a man and I was told him hey you know this is an issue and I don't know that the first couple times he really got it and then at some point it clicked and it was great because he made all these changes where he, he actually had her head of HR sit down with all the women on the team and understand from them, like, what were they feeling? Um, and there was this notion that there was a bro culture on this team and that women couldn't succeed or women didn't feel included. Um, and a lot of these women uh, were able to come up with suggestions of things to do to help fix that team's culture. And so we were able, so then the, our head of HR shared those findings with that leader and he made a ton of changes, including um, having the having all the people on his team go to microaggressions training. 
to understand like what were the things that they were doing that were microaggressions that may may make women on the team not feel as welcome and he came up like I didn't push him to do that I just exposed the problem to him so I was really excited to see him really taking initiative to change something that um, was not a problem that he felt was on the team but was a problem that was being surfaced by women on his team I, I think that's a great example of what you guys were able to do for the women who are out there who don't have a CEO yeah. who, who steps yeah. in and says, hey, there's a problem, what advice would you give them? I think yeah, in the Bay Area, we're very lucky in that there's a lot of job opportunities. And there are a lot of companies that have great leaders or a lot of teams within larger companies that have great leaders. I think it is very, very hard to be successful if you don't feel like your leader is going to champion you or, or invest in you. And so finding ways to either transfer a different part of the organization or find another company um, that will support you because you really need those champions. There is a lot that you personally can do to help grow your career, but the max is out at a point where uh, if, if you don't have other people within the organization that are going to champion you. I'd love to open it up to questions. You can pick. I can pick. Yeah. <laughs> I think stressful. I saw the woman with a white jacket on <laughs> first. Yeah. And then I'll look this way. Yeah. I'm a lucky live ramper, so, um, so I hear all the good stuff that you just said. Uh, if you have to look back at your life and evaluate your career, uh, what is that one single piece of advice that you would give uh, people who are early in career? Uh, so I'll give two things. One is learn as much as possible. Uh, information is power. So everything you learn is going to be valuable, whether it's about um, the product that your company is selling, about what different teams are doing, um, that can be incredibly valuable. And then the second piece of that, which I think is somewhat similar, is building a broad set of connections within their organization. Uh, I, there, as organizations get bigger, and we have felt this so acutely as we've scaled, uh, it's very hard for team collaboration between teams because mu becomes much more challenging because you're talking to someone that you don't know at all. And the first time you talk to them, if you're talking to them about a problem that you're going to have to jointly solve, it's not a great foundation to start on. Um, and you want to build these foundations of trust and you want to understand where are different people are coming from in the organization. And they should understand where you're coming from too. So if you build a lot of connections with different people in the organization, um, it will not only expose new opportunities to you, but it will also provide you more knowledge and information and relationships to be successful in whatever it is that you're tackling. Hi, I was wondering if you could talk about how the cultural integration has gone with the parent company. Sure. And if you faced any particular challenges since you've taken on this role. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. It, when we were acquired, there was a, a recognition um, from the CEO of our parent company that the culture of LiveRamp was very different from the culture of our parent company. And the nice thing was is that we were actually able to operate independently and um, and really opt in to what we wanted to bring in from the broader company into LiveRamp. Uh, so that was a great foundation because we weren't forced to like assimilate ourselves into the broader company. Um, that from, but there have been a lot of challenges. Um, a lot of those challenges come from the fact that the strategies of the our parent company and the products of our parent company were very different from our own. So our parent company was a services-oriented organization uh, where we were basically selling people's time, uh, whereas our company is a product-oriented um, company. So it like a lot of the conflict that we would have was like uh, was. Uh, our parent company, like salespeople wanting to say yes to everything that a client wants, whereas we were like, we can't do that. And so there were clashes that come there. There was clashes because we were relatively younger compared to the demographic. And, and again, we were viewed as kids. We were There were a lot of layoffs that happened at our parent company before we joined and even during the, um, during the past four years, which made people very concerned about their job security, made them feel like we were coming in and taking their jobs. So it's been, there's a lot of things that have been really tough. I think uh, what we've done, or what I've tried to do in all my years before, even before our CEO was sheltering most of the company from those challenges as much as I could and taking on the burden of like going and calling out what would, what it was that needed to change um, or dealing with the conflict situations and trying to make sure that the rest of the team wasn't impacted. And so a few of us in the leadership team did that. And I think that's what made a lot of the integration successful and allowed us to get over the bumps in the road without everyone in the organization feeling that pain all the time. 
Annika, thanks so much for sharing your amazing story. I, I, I'm a former CEO in the financial service industry, and I often ask CEOs um, how much time do they spend working on their business as opposed to in it. Um, can you share? And that? how do you define the difference between that? On it being out and looking into the future two years from now versus working on the day to day problems. Yeah. Um, so it's hard to say like what percentage of my time. It's certainly a mixture of both. Um, I often think about we need to, I, I think about planning for the future so we know like what we can do now to make, make us hit our future plans. Um, so it's certainly a mixture of both. Sometimes there's an acute problem that I need to solve now. For the most part, what I try to do in order to make the space both mentally and in my schedule to focus on the long term is as much as possible, push the, the issues and current challenges of what's happening in the business today down to other leaders, because they're going to be the ones that are closest to the problem and they have the most context on how to solve them. And I'm there to brainstorm ideas or push if I feel like a leader isn't doing what they need to do. Uh, but that, that's where I try to say, like, as much as I can push down um, and I don't, I'm not focused on the day to day issues, um, that's great. And that way I can actually have the time to focus on what does the long term look like and what do we need to do as an organization to set ourselves up for the long term. Thank you. Your story is great. So, you, I think, are very lucky that you've had the opportunity to work in practically all the different divisions mm -hmm. in your company. So what division do you think prepared you most to become CEO? I think I got so much value from every part that I worked in because obviously as CEO, you're overseeing it all. So understanding um, just how different functions work, like what, what do people think about in each of those functions is very valuable. Um, having spent the most time in product management, though, I would say that product management actually prepared me the best because product management is all about like how do you ask the right questions to figure out what you need to do, um, or at least that's what it is in my mind. And I think in, in, as a product manager, you're, you're kind of, you're working with a lot of experts. You're working with the engineering team, who's an expert. You're working with the sales team, who's an expert. You're working with marketing, who's an expert on how to, like, what is the messaging that we're using that's most successful for the project? And often you're the linchpin. So you're not the expert necessarily in anything. You're just, the, you're the expert in bringing all that information together. And that's what it's like to be a CEO. You're, all the people on my management team are experts experts in their area and know way more about their area than I do. And including our head of product who has way more experience in product management than I do. And for me, like what my, I feel like my job is, is to ask the questions, to expose where the problems are and to expose where the opportunities are. Thank you so much. I am curious to learn a little bit more about the balance between you and your co-partner, the other CEO. Yes. Um, if male or female? Male. Okay. Curious to learn about challenges um, and or benefits to that partnership and also the different genders. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, so my co-CEO um, was previously our head of sales and I've worked with him for five years now or a little over that, I think. Uh, and we have a really, really great relationship. Um, so often like in, you can have sales and product relationships that are pretty negative. Ours was always very constructive and positive. So that was a great starting place. Um, he is, he's a lot older than me. He's probably 25 years older than me. So um, it's like there's an age difference, there's a gender gap. Um, I think one of the things that I feel very lucky about is that he is ne he always treats me as an equal. Uh, even though our experience level is really different, uh, he 100% of the time like always treats me as an equal. So the way that we split things now is, first of all, we try to make ourselves interchangeable as much as possible. That way, if he's on vacation, I can handle everything that's happening. If he, if I'm on vacation, he can, or if we we can actually just double the amount of bandwidth we have as CEOs. Um, the, the way, because he has more sales experience, he uh, manages all of the GMs for our, our business lines and I manage all the functional leaders. That's how we made it simple so that at least people knew who they reported to. In reality, there are, uh, there are places where I get involved, obviously, in the businesses and he gets involved in some of the functions. Uh, but that's how we, we, we have split it. Um, 
the great the I think what has worked really well is that the manage everyone on our management team and even lower in the organization kind of knows who to go to for what. So we're not stepping on each other's toes. We have we are communicating constantly, so multiple times a day by phone, by email, by text. Um, so we kind of are keeping each other in the loop on on what's happening. Uh, but by and large, people know where to go for stuff, and we respect the decisions that the other makes. So if he makes a decision on something, um, I'll respect that. If he if I make a decision on something, he respects that. And where we want each other's opinions and where we know the other person has expertise, we're able to bring that in. It works because we have a f great foundation of trust and because we both have low egos. So we're not trying to, we're, there's no power play going on. We're just trying to make the business successful. And so it's, uh, it, 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 we are able to operate successfully because of that. I think we have time for about two more questions. And I saw, I think, two here. Hi, Annika. Thank you so much. I'm Jocelyn King from Spremo, a tech startup down here in the Valley. And I've gotten so much out of everything you've said. I wanted to know how you personally are leading um, diversity and inclusion within your company, particularly so that you're accelerating innovation because you're in such a highly innovative space. Yes. And how do you do that? And what's the expectation of that you put on your executive team for that? So uh, Shweta, who is over here, she leads a lot of our diversity and inclusion initiatives across the company. So we have, a, we actually have time and, and a dedicated effort towards that. But then for me personally, um, there are things, there are different things that I've done. First, um, I started our Ladies at Live Ramp group, which is for all the women in the organization, about three years ago when we started hearing uh, things around some of the women feeling like they didn't have the opportunity to get promoted as much as men in the organization. And that was really concerning to me. So uh, me and and a few other women in the organization started this group just so we could listen to what people's issues were and then help solve those issues across different teams in the organization. Um, so that, that was something we did early on. Um, now, um, I really push our leadership team to focus on diversity and inclusion. So we did a, like a leadership offsite in April and we did a basically a brainstorm around like, what do we want? What is, what would people say about the company today? What would we want people to say about the company in a year? And then what are the things that we each individually can do to, to generate those positive outcomes? And everyone from the leadership team had to take away one, at least one action item for what they were going to do to promote diversity and inclusion in the organization. Um, and I think that that worked really well. And a lot of leaders have have now invested in that. We've also done Q&A sessions with different panels of leaders, and that has helped them not only share their what they're doing, but also hear from employees who care about this a lot so that they recognize how important it is to, to focus on these efforts. And then we're setting up some mentorship uh, mentorship uh, uh, programs for women and, and minorities in the organization, as well as everyone else too, but with the focus there first. And yeah, there's always more work to do. So looking forward to seeing what, what, more, what progress we can make in the next year. We'll take one more question. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned that you struggled to find a, a software engineering job out of college because of your lack of CS degree. Um, how did you work through that? And then when you got the position, how did you make up for that lack of knowledge? Yeah, so I mean, there were a lot of jobs that just, that people that just wouldn't hire me because I wasn't able to pass the tech interviews. Um, I think, I, again, I got lucky in that the company that I'm at did want to take a chance on me and had a history of investing in people that didn't have as, as solid of a CS background to bring into the organization. Um, I also interviewed for product manager roles. So at the time that I accepted the offer with LiveRamp, I had an offer from a, for another role at, as a PM at another company. I was really wary about taking that role, though, because I didn't know. I, I didn't think that the leadership in that company was great, and I didn't believe in the product either, so I didn't really want that. But it was nice knowing that like I had a backup option. And I also didn't put uh, too much pressure on myself. I was like, if I don't have a job by the time I graduate, it's okay. Like, I will find something. So I just want to find something that's the right fit for me. And then what was the second part of your question? Oh, how did you make up for that? Oh, how did I make up for it? Um, so I tried to learn a lot from the engineer leaders that we had. I knew I didn't have a lot of experience. The nice thing about software engineering is you can learn a lot from the internet too. So whenever I came across a problem I didn't know how to do, uh, how to solve, I would look up and like read stuff on Stack Overflow and other other, other uh, resources around that. There's probably I could have taken more classes or done things like that, but I didn't do that. Um, but tried to just do as much learning on the job as possible. Thanks. I think in the interest of keeping everything on track, um, that was our last question. Thank you so much Thank for you. your time. Thank you.